Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi. And once again, we have this great privilege here in EWTN to come together to hear the gospel as it's played out in the life of one of God's children. We're joined by Paul Rose tonight. He's a former evangelical. Paul, thank you for being here to share your story, brother. My pleasure, John Mark. We're going to talk a little bit about it later, but you have a really uh, interesting, wonderful ministry called singthehours.org. Uh, having to do with the Liturgy of the Hours and chant, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. It's something I very much enjoyed and will encourage people to check out. But let's go back to the beginning, and uh, where does your story begin? My story begins where most <laughs> stories in faith begin. It begins <laughs> in baptism. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I grew up in a in a evangelical context. Our mm -hmm. church called itself interdenominational in California, Northern California, and uh Santa Clara County. And the church was open to do a, a lot of different things. There were adult baptisms like the Baptists do, and there were also, if a family requested it, the church was willing to do infant baptism. So the life of grace was poured out on me right from the beginning. And even though I didn't deserve it and didn't didn't uh, didn't really deserve much at, as an infant, I had no merit, <laughs> no works. The, the full grace of uh, membership in the church was given to me even though I didn't know and didn't care, which is a, a really uh, a beautiful beginning. And I, and I want to say that I know that in, in the last 10 years, my understanding of what exactly God has done in, in my life mm -hmm. and how I got here has changed and developed and shifted and ebbed and flowed. And I know that in 10 years, I'll look back on this interview and think, wow, that's an interesting <laughs> perspective I had at, at uh, mm -hmm. 28 years old. And and I might not even agree with everything I said in this interview. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I come here with humility and yeah. not only do I not have uh, everything figured out, generally speaking, but certainly even about my own life. It's a, it's a mystery the way God works yeah. and we'll, we'll just do the best we can in this, yeah. in this interview. To... Well, prayerfully reflecting on the good things the Lord has done. Again, I think we'll talk about praying the Psalms later on. That's kind of what we're doing when we pray the Psalms. Like we keep continually reflecting on what's happened, salvation, history, yes. what God's done in our lives. But reflecting on that and learning from that, well, that's that's part of the lifelong journey, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you you have a in the Psalms, you have every Catholic priest is canonically obligated to pray through all the Psalms every month, hmm. and so you're right. It's like you're doing it over and over again, and it's ever new yeah. and ever meaningful, uh, in spite of being done over yeah. and over and over again. So, started a baptism, mm -hmm. and I I think that. No man is an island, right? We're not born into a vacuum of culture. So I guess the real story begins with my parents right. and their respective starting mm -hmm, places. Mm -hmm. So you want to talk about my mom yeah. or my dad first? Oh, either one. Yeah. Your, your dad. <laughs> my dad gr grew up, uh, I think, mainline Protestant evangelical. Okay. He uh, was a, a military brat. Isn't that the technical term <laughs> people so. use? Very technical. So, yeah. so he actually was on a, a base in Germany in some of his very early years. He traveled all around. My my grandfather is a uh, retired colonel in the army, okay. and they kind of ended up, even though they lived everywhere, they ended up in Saratoga, California, Northern California, beautiful town, beautiful wine country, mm. Silicon Valley. It's always sunny, and the hills <laughs> are gorgeous. And uh, he, as his, as a child, I think his home church became the church that we ended up going to when uh, we moved back to California as an adult. Mm -hmm. On a totally separate coast, in a completely different cultural context, my mother is a first, second generation Italian immigrant, okay. and from from two different parts of Italy, from Bari and from Sicily, both very poor parts of Italy, mm -hmm. from where her ancestors came from, mm -hmm. and both very good people, very 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 deeply Catholic, yeah. and her family came to the United States on both both sides seeking the American dream of a better life. I think that uh, her, her grandparents on one side briefly moved back to Italy. And my grandpa spent a few years growing up in Italy when he, was, when he was a little boy. And then Mussolini kind of rose into power and they didn't want anything to do with Mussolini. So they came back to the United States and Boston was their landing pad in That's the United States. And Boston is a beautiful Catholic scene. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I live in Boston now. Mm -hmm. This is very, I mean, I, I've very interrelated to both my parents' journeys yeah. um, in terms of where I've ended up. And Boston is a deeply Catholic place in terms of its uh, its cultural history. Right. You, you have the Irish Catholics and the, and the Italian Catholics and um, even some, some of the German Catholics are there. And now you have a huge 
Portuguese Catholic community, Portuguese speaking from Brazil. Right. And there's all these different waves of immigrants that have come and established a deeply Catholic uh, sensibility in Boston. It's also, of course, a place where there was huge scandal mm -hmm. and huge um, trauma that happened in, in the Catholic world in Boston. And uh, I mean, I, I've, I've loved and will get there to my, my Boston uh, journey later in life. But that's the context my mother grew up in, uh, deeply Catholic in a certain way. But mm -hmm. by the time she was a little girl, her parents would send them off to church in right. the snow. They would walk uh, about a mile and a half to church, tr trudging through the snow, her siblings, her cousins. But they would sleep in and never. She doesn't remember maybe even a single time her parents going to church with her. But she went every Sunday as a little girl. She remembers when it was the uh, the pre-Vatican II liturgy, and she remembers the the uh, to to her little girl sensibilities what seemed like very dramatic changes. Um, but by the time she hit college, she had basically stopped practicing altogether. And you can't blame her. Her parents didn't practice. And right, right. in college, she was swept away into evangelical Christianity, as many many um, many people were in college campus groups at the time. Uh, I, I, re I remember her uncle told me, I think she came back from college one day and said, you know, if you guys really want to know Jesus, you have to read the Bible, she says to my illiterate grandmother. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, you go to college, you learn all this wisdom, but you also... You, you lose some wisdom, too, at college. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the thought that the, my third grade educated, if that Italian grandma just had to read the Bible to right. know Jesus, right. was kind of like a, a, a crazy thing to think of, um, of saying. But, you know, it, obviously my, um, my mother became very on fire for religion, mm -hmm. uh, maybe for the first time, although she would say that as a little girl, she did um, learn that there was a really beautiful God mm -hmm. and that God existed from her experience in Catholic liturgy. Of course, all of the, right. the foundation was laid, but um, she she received more of a, uh, for better or for worse, I think. I mean, she would say, of course, mm -hmm. my uh, my evangelical journey eventually brought me to a fullness of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Me as my, my cynical millennial self is like, but why do you have to become evangelical for so many years? My, my mother and father are now fully in the, in the church, mm -hmm. um, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if it was a, it was a coming home for my mother sure. and for my dad it was also sort of a coming home even though he had no catholic framework growing mm -hmm. up he came from the evangelical context right. um and then they moved from boston they lived in boston for for many years and moved to california when my oldest sibling i'm from eight children there's okay. i'm one of eight my uh oldest three siblings were born in massachusetts and then the rest of us were born in california california right. kids and we're all throughout our entire childhood, part of my dad's childhood church, even though he lived in Boston. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that both my parents were serious evangelicals at the time they were, because that mm -hmm. led them to each other. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they've, I think they've met each other, fell in love, and I don't recommend this to anybody. I'm glad the Catholic Church has rules about this. I think they got engaged after like two or three weeks of meeting, and they married within three or four months of meeting, oh. if, if memory serves. Okay. So. But that's because they were swept away in this enthusiasm, which I'm, I credit my existence to, because if they never met, I mean, where would I be? I'd be a, a twinkle in, in the Lord Jesus' eyes. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, they, they met at like a missionary intensive in Santa Barbara, California, that my mom went to to sort of figure out what she wanted to do with her life. I think they both fancied themselves being missionaries someday, mm -hmm. um, which didn't happen as they would have thought. But... Um, they did have eight children, which is a crazy yeah. thing to do, in, in, and it almost is sort of a missionary thing to do in a culture where that's right. like an insane, an insane person thing. Right. So right. Um, they ended up in California. I was baptized, and that begins my journey from that context okay. of where my parents were at. So the baptism uh, was important to them, and did you, did the family practice the faith uh, through your childhood? The, the evangelical faith, deeply, yeah. yeah. Okay. My, my dad, um, and my dad in his evangelical backdrop was always a closet Catholic intellectually because <laughs> he was a nerd, loved reading <laughs> classics, history, church fathers. He was fed on the, um, like, it was so funny. I, I, I have friends who went to like Protestant schools when, when they were growing up. And uh, even my wife would say that they, the history that she learned was the Bible and then suddenly the 16th century. <laughs> She did not know a single thing about Christian or Western civilization history between the first century and the 16th century. Right. And she never thought that was unusual, which is such a funny thing that like, <laughs> yeah. and, and like from a, from a 
evangelical context, you, you think that like history started with the, the Reformation. And mm -hmm. even nowadays, most evangelicals don't even get Reformation history because there's been a departure from mm -hmm. the evangelical worldview and even what the, the, the Reforming Fathers had. Right. But my dad was just a deeply rooted in, um, from Socrates all the way to um, Anselm and then beyond, my, my dad was deeply in love with classics and the Church Fathers. Yeah. And um, he studied Greek and would have his Greek New Testament and studied early church hymns. He, he did translations himself mm. of some early church hymns like Fos Hilleron, O Gladsome Light. Mm. And my mother, because she was in love with her Italian culture, even though she would, she didn't intentionally do this, she subconsciously was still in love with Catholic culture. Like she taught us Latin, even though she was completely, you know, the Catholic Church is, you know, wrong about everything. She still deeply loved, you know, um, the language of Latin mm -hmm. and even some of the, the Latin chant. Like we learned I knew the Agnus Dei when I was like five years old because we sung it in a choral context. We went to a, a I was raised in a sort of homeschooling context. Mm -hmm. And so from, uh, and we had choirs and I went to school only two days a week in this homeschooling context in elementary school and then high school three days a week. It was kind of like a preparatory right. thing. Um, and it was a classical education. So we, I didn't see it as unusual a part of my evangelical upbringing to sing Latin chant and to know the Our Father in Latin and mm -hmm. to do the AP Latin and to study Virgil and to read um, classic philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was part of everybody's Protestant upbringing because my parents, that was just their unique, weird, right. um, you know, exception to the rule. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so so I, I was formed culturally by my mother, uh, probably against her own will. She just couldn't help <laughs> herself being in love with her Italian, which is a Latin upbringing. Um, I mean, we're looking at a uh, picture of the Vatican right now, and that mm -hmm. happens to be in, in Rome, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, is that the Vatican? That's the Vatican, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah that's it's it. from like a... A lawn height or something. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, the the music part was big from the beginning. Sure. Being being raised exposed to like choral music, sacred music, that mm -hmm. gave me a sense of the sacred. The, the church we went to is also weird in that they called themselves interdenominational. And I, okay. and I say weird affectionately, not like yeah. it was weird. It was just yeah. like unusual from even what my fellow non-denominational friends went to. Whereas many churches would choose to call themselves non-denominational or mm -hmm. claim to be a particular, they intentionally were like, we are interdenominational. So like, oh, you believe in infant <laughs> baptism? Let's go for it, you know? And right. um, they also had architecture, which as far as churches in the area I grew up in go, it looked um, as Catholic as any Catholic church did. <laughs> in fact, a very famous architect uh, in California history, a, a female architect, and I'm blanking on her name, she did Hearst Castle, which is a, a very famous landmark in California. Mm -hmm. William Randolph Hearst was the, the mudslinger journalist guy. He was like a billionaire back in the day, and he built this massive castle. The same woman who designed his castle architect, she also designed the, the chapel at our church. Huh. Um, and it, it gave you a sense of the sacred, the architecture. I remember being like a three-year-old and wandering around our facility and feeling a sense of the sacred mm -hmm. um, simply because it had traditional Catholic forms in its architecture, hmm. which was really beautiful. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting how beauty, God can work through beauty in all of its forms because God is beauty incarnate. Hmm. He is beauty. Um, God is, just like God is objective truth mm -hmm. and goodness, God also is objective beauty. Right. We tend to, even, even as like r religious people in the modern day, we tend to just accept that beauty, oh, it's subjective. No, no, no. Beauty is not subjective. Beauty right. is is an, is has an objective reality too. There are mm -hmm. forms, classical forms, and otherwise that are objectively beautiful right. and sensible. And I know that from music because there's dissonance and then there's there's not dissonance. You know, yeah. there's harmony and harmony is has objective scientific realities mm -hmm. and is objectively beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's there's um, architectural things I was exposed to. Even liturgical. My dad was kind of a. It was a beautiful thing he used to do where I remember from my earliest days when we would give the little plastic uh, communion cups and yeah. the, the grape juice, my dad would commune me as if I was receiving the greatest, most awesome, terrible, mysterious thing you can imagine. He would whisper in my ear, he would say, this is my body poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in memory of me. And he would commune me like... As, a, as the priest of his home. And I think he took that very seriously mm. and he longed for what he read about in the patristics of like right. a real authentic body and blood of Christ communion. Mm -hmm. And he did the best he could of t at least taking the symbol very seriously instead right. of just, you know, cavalierly 
you know, just passing out the grape juice cups and doing a little ceremony, my dad whispered it as if it was a great mystery and secret that needed to be both believed and revered. Mm -hmm. And so that primed me too. There were all these things in my early childhood that were just like deeply priming me with a Catholic sensibility that I didn't know at the time was a uniquely Catholic sensibility. Mm -hmm. I thought this is just how Christianity is. But then I would sometimes go to my friends' churches Mm -hmm. and um, it was more of just like a, uh, you know, you have your self-help sermon, right? Which is like 40 minutes long and uh, it's it's your self-help sermon based with, you know, with biblical allusions and texts. Mm -hmm. And then you have your... um, your uh your concert with the with the you know microphones and the smoke machines and whatever Mm. and i thought you know i guess this is tangentially in the ballpark of what i was raised with but uh we were raised with something that looked a little bit more like catholicism even Mm. though it it, it was not it looked a little bit more so that and since conversion it 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 is a process of the heart as much as it is of the Mm. intellect like i can see that that mattered right i can see that it it made less of a um a leap in my in my sensibility to yeah. be raised with those different flashpoints of culture mm. that were just by the grace of God, just by his providence. Yeah. And all the while I had grace working in me because God baptized me mm-hmm. of his own good pleasure. God filled me with his spirit um, as an infant. And so all of this was in the context of grace too, yeah. not just in terms of the providence of uh, God's God's uh, God's good pleasure. Yeah. How, how did that land at that point in your life? Did you... Uh, w- did you develop a sense of God, a sense of prayer? Did you have a prayer life uh, as a as a child? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. I had a lot of, I was a pretty wicked child. I think, I mean, Augustine would say the same thing about himself. <laughs> not, not like an exceptionally wicked child, yeah. but I, I can remember that I did things like uh, when I was five years old, I um, figured out that with cash I could buy Legos. So I started stealing cash from my mom's purse. Mm when I was a, before the age of reason, but I do remember that. And, mm. I, and, I, and I remember as I did it each time, I became more reasonable about it, thinking this is wrong. This mm. doesn't belong to me. And finally, it got to the point where um, where I confessed it. And my dad was, he had been immersed in, he really treated himself by the time he got to me. I think all of my siblings had a different childhood. Mm-hmm. I'm number six of eight. <laughs> by the time you get to six, parents have figured out yeah. what is no longer essential. I think I had a much more lenient childhood, right. but also I had a rapport with my parents that I don't think my older siblings had, um, God bless them, mm-hmm. because I think my my parents had figured out better how to like interact with children. And I think this is true of any anybody with a big family is that you get you get better and better at it. Right. So um, my I, I, I confessed things to my dad, mm. mm-hmm. which my older siblings like, why would you tell your why? That's so weird. I, I told my parents, like almost sacramentally, I'm so sorry. Two years ago, I stole $120 from you. Please forgive me. And it was just like such a weird, but it ate me up. So like the the right and wrong sensibility, um, It I mean, it's such a, it's such a, f- a funny thing for yeah. a five-year-old to do, first of all. Yeah. But it's a good reminder that we are born into um, a state of concupiscence, a state mm-hmm. of desiring what is evil. And I, I have the weird backdrop of having a very good memory, even from age two. Huh. And so even I remember before I was reasonable, which is a bizarre thing. So I remember my evil inclinations, even if at the time I was incapable of really understanding the fullness of their rightness or wrongness. Mm-hmm. And through that, I definitely had a prayer life. Um, my family uh, had kind of a quasi-liturgical prayer life. My dad would like to sing with us, mm-hmm. sing sing hymns with us. And it was, a, you know, yeah, I, I would say that. Um, but but my prayer life was based on the the dichot- the um the framework of my father instead of our father, mm. which is true of any evangelical framework. Mm. You're you're so fixed on the personal relationship that we've made this buzzword, which actually the word, just, the phrase doesn't exist in scripture. Mm. There's no scripture that puts as a set central tenet of Christianity the need for a personal relationship. Mm. And much to the opposite, of course I would argue you need a personal relationship, but I think that that's, um, that's not the goal the goal is to be in a corporate relationship, singing the praises of God with all the saints in heaven. I don't want to be in heaven alone with Jesus. Mm-hmm. The personal relationship is not the goal. Right. That's why Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, says you must pray our Father, not my Father. Yeah. Not, not give me this day my daily bread. Sure. It's give us this day. And it's much more, and that's that no man should boast. Adam mm-hmm. and Eve, when it was just them, they really messed up. But Jesus, 
our relationship with God is personal only insofar as it's an, as it's an association with Jesus' personal relationship with, with God sure. the Father. And that's such a distinction between the, the kind of prayer you have as, a, mm-hmm. as an evangelical growing up mm-hmm. and the prayer we have as Catholics being prayer that is corporate, where, yeah. we, where we present it as one voice mm-hmm. that no man should boast. Yeah, you know, it sort of reminds me of, of getting married and having kids. Like, I, I, I thought, and I think I did, had, had a personal relationship with Christ before I became married. But I didn't realize until after I became married and had children, how much my personal relationship was still very me-focused. Once I brought other people into that, it was personal as opposed to impersonal. Right? Yes, it, yes, exactly. Right? Bingo, that's but, brilliant. But okay. bringing it into the context of family, you know, that God calls us into family, into body, that's where our, our, the personal relationship becomes not about me, but about, about the family, about the other. So That's amazing. And I think you just solved the problem that I was trying to... Because <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm like, like I said, this is sure. the first time I've had like an, an extensive yeah. retelling of this whole thing. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head. Mm-hmm. It's, it's personal because it involves persons, not right. robots. Right. It's not impersonal. Yeah. It's, it's the most deeply personal relationship ever because God is, a, is persons. Right. God is three persons. Right. But... It is not personal in the sense of being individual and me alone. Right. That is the greatest mistake yeah. that I think somebody can make because then it's not about love of God and love of neighbor, mm-hmm. which is the greatest tenet of the law. That's that's extra personal. Mm-hmm. That's that's outward facing. Mm-hmm. And prayer is not about my father. Mm-hmm. It's about our father. Mm-hmm. And and it's where two or three are gathered in my name. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to be personally there. Yeah. But that's a distinction. It's it's not personal being meaning solo. Right. It's personal meaning it is persons. Yeah. And even when you pray to God, you're praying to a community of persons mysteriously it, in the yeah, Trinity. Yeah. God, God Himself is is not an individual. He's even a community. Again, in, in a mystery that we can't fully fathom. Uh, even in the nature of God Himself is community. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, beautiful. So okay, we got about five minutes before the break here. But you, uh, uh, an amazingly blessed, graced childhood in many ways that planted so many wonderful seeds. Oh, uh, what happened then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's let, let's get right up yeah, to the cusp here. Sure, so sure. I'm a teenager. Okay. Let's skip to that. And I had been to church, Catholic church, intermittently as a child because, especially when my uncle Frank would come into town, love my uncle Frank, very holy man. He was Catholic up in Portland, Oregon. He'd he'd uh, he'd come down, and uh, when he was in town, we would go to mass with him. Mm-hmm. And I, at some of the churches that I went to um, when I when I went to mass as a kid, I wasn't impressed. I thought um, the the hmm, there is a, a a variance you can get at different Catholic churches today. And as a, as a kid. Um, the the ones that were more, to be honest, uh, let, let's just say happy clappy, mm-hmm. um, as a kid that didn't impress me. Mm-hmm. I I thought um, this is like, you know, worse worse music than we get at the evangelical church. <laughs> and when, as a kid, not understanding there's something deeper there, which right. is, I mean, right. obviously you're getting an encounter with God Himself in liturgy. Mm-hmm. Christ is there. Christ is present there in in the Eucharist, but even in the assembly, Christ is present there in in liturgy itself. And um, not necessarily understanding that as a little kid, what what was present to me was sort of um, music that I felt this probably went out of style 30 years ago. Right. It, I, I knew it did as a kid. I thought <laughs> I want to listen. If I'm going to listen to music, I don't need to listen to the current Christian hits, right? Yeah. Like at, at my Protestant church, we're doing "Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord," and then at the Catholic church, we're doing something that um, we do occasionally once a year, just to like do what the oldies did in the 70s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. some some like you know. And um, so that, that uh, to, as a little kid, um, that made me not take Catholicism seriously at times. Yeah. But the, of course, bad music, good music, no music, the, the mystery of the Catholic Mass and Catholic, Catholic worship and then Catholic praise and prayer in the mm-hmm. Liturgy of the Hours, it is infinitely deep. Um, and when I was a teenager and started studying, I began to understand that. Okay. And also, as a young kid, we did go to the Catholic, the Byzantine Catholic Church, the Eastern Rite. Mm. Um, and that's because my uncle was very, very in love with all the rites. So some some holy weeks when he would come, he'd be like, you know, we got to go to the Byzantine because my uncle is very ec- ecumenical. And so we went to the Byzantine Rite and that blew me away as a kid. Mm. As a kid, I was like, oh yeah, these guys are, 
these guys are Catholic and um, this must be what's happening at the, even though it doesn't look like it, this is what's happening at the sort of um, suburban parish down the street. But this is like insanely, this is worship like none other. Everybody's chanting, everybody's singing in unison, they're singing a cappella. Every man, woman, and child is singing along. Um, these prayers are old. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can feel that they're old. The language is um, so, so cutting and prayerful. I remember everything, every part of that liturgy to this day. I haven't probably been to it in five years, the Byzantine, no, no, maybe three, three to five years. I remember every chant in it. Mm -hmm. By death he conquered death, and to those in the tomb he gave them life. Or let us who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn and sing the thrice holy... I'm like, dude, that became a part of me because mm -hmm. it like flows right out of heaven and these, these cherubic hymns you're singing and everyone's mm -hmm. doing it. And after a few times being there, you learn it and you're, and you're with the assembly. And like the Byzantine Catholic rite, if, if um, mm -hmm. those listening, if you haven't been to other rites in the yeah, Catholic Church, the visit, yeah. like the Byzantine or the Maronite, they sing everything, which is which is much more natural to prayer that we have something sacred that we're yeah. doing, um, and it blew my socks off as a little kid. They even had me when I was ten years old. I remember it was it was a Good Friday or something. They said, "We're doing the procession. You must carry the gifts." And we're like, "What?" <laughs> and they said, "You're a child. You, you're you're going to do it." They handed me like a box full of nails or something to represent. I I don't remember what it was, but then we started walking around the church and everyone was singing this very solemn thing, and I'm carrying these nails and I'm like, "Oh my gosh." Jesus was struck with these nails and I don't know what is going on, but I'm a part of this and this is bigger than me and this is crazy. And it definitely had a very, very insane impression on me of giving me a sense that there is a, yeah. Yeah, well, you, made, you made a comment there that I think it is something we would recommend. Yeah, check out, go experience the different rites of the church because sometimes in the contrast, you do recognize the, the essential elements. Exactly. You know, and sometimes you don't see them when you're used to a certain liturgy or the way that you're your particular parish has a certain liturgy, but sometimes seeing that contrasted with a different rite or an older rite, you 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 draw the thread of connection of oh I, I see now what the, what the essential is, what the essence and is. And then here. you see what you're missing at mm -hmm. your at your Protestant church because mm -hmm. I saw even though they came in from two different parts of the world, mm -hmm. right? The Byzantine rite was was founded in the east, mm -hmm. and the Latin rite was founded in the west, and different apostles established the the seeds there, right. and they're doing the. It, it, it is substantially the same worship. Mm -hmm. It's substantially, even if there's um, a co-opting of like hokey hymns from the 70s, and even if as a kid I'm like, wow, that doesn't sound like worship. Um, but even if I, as a kid you can see, once you go to that church and you go to the Byzantine, you can see they're doing the same thing here. Mm -hmm. they're, both, um, they're, they're both consecrating the Eucharist as though it is the body and blood of God himself. They're both effusive about the Virgin Mary, like mm -hmm. it's not, like it's breathing. Mm -hmm. They're effusive about the, the Virgin Mary. They're both um, chanting these things and they're both doing this corporate thing where there's not one musician up there who's like doing stuff, but it's more, it's like there's so many similarities in the mm -hmm. worship that you realize this had to have been from the same source in spite of historically being from different sources. Different apostles went and established these churches, but they had to have been given the same uh, tradition from Christ. Yeah. And and then that that in a historical context it all comes together. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, let's take a little break there again and we'll we'll, we'll pick it back up there. Yeah, because I'm not even Catholic not yet. Not even Catholic yet, story, but yeah. certainly it can so many seeds planted and then as you start to study, you know, more coming come into your mind there. We'll we'll pick up the story here in a Great. minute. Uh thanks for being here. Again, we'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of of Paul's story. Uh and and I want to remind you that if you go to chnetwork.org, you can hear and see and read uh, hundreds of different stories from people from all different backgrounds, the ways that God led them to the Catholic Church. Again, so many ways that God touches us, sometimes through liturgy, through beauty, through the intellect, through our experiences, through our moral convictions. God has so many ways that He leads us to Himself. You'll find a story there that uh, resembles your own. So check out chnetwork.org. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Paul's story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight. I'm speaking tonight with Paul Rose. He's a former evangelical. And Paul, thank you for sharing your story tonight. I really enjoyed it so far. I think we left off. You know, you had this uh, really blessed childhood. You know, so many interesting seeds planted. 
uh, again, with the music and some of the liturgical sensibilities, your father's uh, intellectual journey kind of in the background and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, amazing ways that God worked in your life, you know, and uh, now that you're looking back on it. Then we left off, you know, as a teen, you have things that are that are uh, bringing more of these questions up into your mind through your studies. Uh, pick, pick us up there. Okay, so we're actually going to pick it up with two family members. We'll start with my dad again. Sure. My dad couldn't take it anymore. He had been to enough Byzantine and Orthodox services. He decided, I'm going to become Orthodox. Mm-hmm. Didn't even tell really anybody. Uh, I didn't know it as a kid. I didn't know until after it had, the season had come and gone. He went through the Orthodox RCIA and... At the end of Lent, he was, I think, a week out, if memory serves, from being given the sacraments as an Orthodox. And then, that same week, his evangelical church asked if he'd be an elder. Wow. And so he saw that as a sign in providence. He discerned that, you know, maybe God is asking me to, like, do good with the community that I that I have. And he, I think he went on a crusade to sort of more patristicify his evangelical <laughs> church as an elder. Mm-hmm. He tried to give him more of a, uh, I think he even did a couple seminars where I, I remember, I don't think a lot of people came, but he would be like, all right, guys, we're going to do a seminar in Augustine. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> but he, he ended up taking the position as a elder in his in his evangelical church and just said, okay, Lord, I guess not yet on receiving you in the, in the Eucharist because, I mean, Catholics even teach the, the Orthodox have the Eucharist as well. Right, right. And he was this close, but he, he's, he chuckles that he thinks that eventually God uh, wanted him to arrive in the same place, but the Roman Catholic edition of the same place, <laughs> which is good. But at the same time, my sister Lila had started doing pro-life ministry. Lila Rose mm. had started uh, live action and doing sidewalk ministry to save babies and, and uh, campaign against abortion and do all this this crazy activism and ministry as, as a teenager in high school. And uh, through that, I think she began to see that uh, that the Catholics, her heart was softened as my oldest sister um, towards the Catholics because they were really serious about, about pro-life activism. Right. She went off to school, and I think if memory serves, she a- asked a friend um, where she could find some, I just need some advice, some coaching, some blah, blah, blah. And I think the friend said, what you need is spiritual direction. <laughs> so she walked into a Opus Dei Women's Center mm. and just said, I need spiritual direction. And so a numerary there started meeting with her. And in pretty short order, she decided well off at school, I'm, I'm going to become Catholic. Mm. And then my dad was like, oh, thank you, Providence. Here's my new opportunity. <laughs> and at, this, at the same time, there were some things going on at our evangelical church where there were some, there's always, mm. you know, they have committees on committees to discuss is, uh, you know, this, our certain pastor wants a divorce. Should we let him get a divorce and then still be a pastor? Well, let's have a three-year synod in our elders to mm. figure it out. And my dad's just like pulling his hair out. I don't know why we're, like, what is mm. happening here? Yeah. So in a in a contract in a context of some ter- turmoil at our right. evangelical church, church and my sister Lila being like, hey guys, you know how we, at once in a blue moon we'd go to the Catholic church as a kid? Well, it's pretty awesome. I'm getting spiritual direction, and I'm gonna do it. So that Easter, I think 2009, she became Catholic. We all went down to support her, but there my parents were just like, you know, I think we need to do this too, mm-hmm. um, and both because of the Catholic's clarity on. Uh, pro-life issues, which my family began to be very, very serious about. It was it was the right time. It was the fullness of time. And my sister Lila had a friend in pro-life activism, David Delayden, who is my godfather. Mm. He's also a big figure in, in the pro-life world. Um, and David became a now a, a sort of more contemporary male figure of just being really serious about church. And he uh, introduced me as a young teen to a third type of liturgy, which I'd never seen before. He introduced me to the Latin Mass, which I, I went to a few mm-hmm. times. And then I was like, okay, so I've seen a triangle of different expressions of this. I've seen the um, the current rite of the Roman rite. I've seen this historical Roman rite. I've seen the Byzantine. And yeah, this is this all has, it's a Bermuda Triangle of beauty. <laughs> and whatever I'm doing right now a is Bermuda just Bermuda not... Triangle of beauty. I gotta write that one down. Yeah, yeah. So, so... Um, <laughs> That that yeah. helped me because then I saw in the Latin context, I mm-hmm. saw some um, some sacred chant. And then there's actually, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful parishes in San Jose. We started going to a parish that um, is uh, 
is uh, the current rite in the vernacular, and it's just a very, very holy place. They have dozens of vocations a year. There's like 5,000 Filipinos that go there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a beautiful, and that's another thing that's beautiful, mm -hmm. um, and, I've, and I've seen this discussed on the show before, but like the Catholic Church is so universal. Right. Our church was only, um, only upper-class white Americans, mm -hmm. what our evangelical church. And then mm -hmm. I arrive at the, the Catholic Church, and it's like, what the heck? There's like... The Christianity is universal. There is somebody from literally every single we got, um, and they're sitting next to each other. There's literally, like St. Paul says, no Jew nor Greek, male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. The only place you see that living mm. is the Catholic Church. Like the fact that we have a Byzantine rite, yeah. the fact that it even exists, that we have um, people who are celebrating an entirely different liturgy, but they're totally in communion with Rome. Right. You can slice it a million different ways. We could talk for hours about it, but the church is universal, and that's right. beautiful. Yeah. So um, that uh, also impressed us at the time. And then, I mean, I had read at that time a dozen church fathers back to back. I'm 14 years old, but I've already, I mean, I'm my father's son, and my dad mm -hmm. teaches classics, and I've um, I've translated a bunch of old Latin texts. And um, we uh, met with the priest who confirmed Mila. He said, none of you need RCIA. I'm like, okay, well, then what are you suggesting? He said, come back in August. I'll set the whole thing up. We'll give you all the sacraments. So we came for a weekend. RCA would have been helpful for like figuring out how to go to confession because I had a few <laughs> awkward first confessions. Like in my first confession back home, after I was received into the church, it was beautiful. My parents got their wedding mm, reconfirmed. Right. And, uh, but not all of us went in. It, it's been a, a process for the family. Sure. Like um, at that time after Lila in August, September, we had the four youngest, Bob, um, and my and my two my two little sisters and myself and then uh, my parents all were received and then there were th th uh, three other holdouts at the time now there's two holdouts it's fine God bless them um, the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways but Amen. so where were we I'm, I'm it, losing the plot here yeah you just, the, uh, most of your family much of your family had just come in to the church there. yes and yeah. then I went to confession and my first yeah. confession I was like hi um, um dead silence in the confessional. <laughs> I don't know even know how to begin. I wasn't catechized on how to mm -hmm. begin. So I just said, my name is Paul Rose. I live in South San Jose. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of eight children. And I could tell the priest was like flabbergasted. <laughs> I just started giving him like a biography. And then he said, let's just hear the sins, please. And also, when was your last confession? I said, oh, it was last week. Okay. And what are your sins? I was like, um, well... <laughs> I gossiped or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, okay, next time you don't need to give the biography and please don't say your name. I was like, really? He said, yeah, yeah. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a screen for a reason. <laughs> but like, uh, then the next week I went to, to the Byzantine confession. Mm -hmm. Again, no catechesis could prepare you for it. We go into this little closet and there's no screen in mm -hmm. Byzantine confession. And the priest, he, he, he has to breathe on you. So he's like, he's literally like almost, you can feel the wetness of his breath because they, they believe that because he breathed on his on them, yeah. so there's like this really intimate and it's like and he's got his hands over you and it's like you're all it's very tangible anyway i i wasn't prepared for either byzantine or western confession something to be said for the practical uh in catechesis but yeah. you can learn that on the fly yeah. it's all very simple god 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 bless roman catholicism it's 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 uh one of the benefits over byzantine catholicism is very simple right. our liturgy i mean i love the ornate byzantine mm -hmm. liturgy but mm -hmm. our liturgy is very simple and beautiful um and in my heart at the time, I was thinking, as a 14, almost 15-year-old, I was thinking, you know, I too, given the questions for a 14 and 15-year-old, I too like the Catholic Church's clarity on various issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the Catholic Church's clarity on what um, what my, my maleness means mm -hmm. and what my vocation could mean mm -hmm. and what my role is as a man to lay down my life for people mm -hmm. and to follow Christ and um, what my role would be as a priest or as a father mm -hmm. someday, and what my role is now in terms of how I treat other women mm -hmm. as not commodities, but mm -hmm. as, and I remember that what did it for me when I decided I'm gonna join my parents in September, because my parents just said, hey guys, we're doing this. The first time my dad did it, he did it in secret. There mm -hmm. wasn't even the option, but this time he meekly was like, guys, I know it's kind of a shock, but mom and I are becoming Catholic like Lila did. Any of you are welcome to, and then four of us were like, okay. But when I was thinking about my dad's invitation, like, yeah. okay, I can become confirmed next to the day. I, um, I stumbled upon a website, What is Mortal Sin? Hmm. And it very clearly, just from the catechism, it was just quotes from the catechism. Um, and it quoted the catechism on why, for example, pornography is wrong, why masturbation is wrong, 
uh, why and it, it went to various sexual sins, sex trafficking. I'm like, uh, that doesn't relate to a 14 year old boy, yeah. but like, I mean, great sex trafficking. It is wrong. Yes, I mean, I'm yes. so glad we all know this, yeah. but like to read so clearly when, um, when pornography is so prevalent mm -hmm. to read so clearly, this is why it's wrong. You know, it uh, mm -hmm. takes the image of God and turns it into a commodity. And it also uh, is right. an offense against the do not lust even with your eyes. And then to talk to Protestant friends at the time who defended it, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm not actually like, you know, um, committing fornication with a woman. This is just like, it means nothing, you know, mm. um, to have those debates and then to see so clearly the Catholic church be like, oh no, here's, here's the, uh, more f philosophically based principles mm. of Catholic ethic, Christian ethic yeah. was really attractive to me yeah. as a 14 year old wanting to know what was right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, a formerly scrupulous 14 year old who, um, you know, used to be guilty when he was five years old about stealing cash from his parents, which is a wild thing. Right. But, uh, yeah, so that that sort of moral beauty, mm -hmm. um, it transcended any. I had a lot of questions about liturgy. I had a lot of questions about worship, but those uh, didn't matter to me when I was faced with. I thought we'll figure that out. I have a whole lifetime to, to learn right. how to worship. Right. In fact, we have eternity to learn how to worship because that's mm -hmm. the end goal. The mm -hmm. end goal is to be eternally singing the praises of God in heaven. Mm -hmm. But um, for now, for food for the journey, if I'm going to get to heaven, I need to know what is good and bad. Mm -hmm. I need to know how Jesus is working in my life and I need to receive Jesus. Yeah. And so like those were clearly given and it was yeah. beautiful to not have to be rebaptized. They looked at my baptismal certificate, which said I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the priest was like, you've always been Catholic. And I was like, amen. Yeah. What a wonderful thing that I just need to be chrismed. And then, you know, given I, I received chism and, um, baptism, not baptism and confirmation and Eucharist in the same weekend. Mm, beautiful. And it was just a, a me, I, I was, crying profusely in my yeah. confession just because like I had had that experience with my dad many other times in my childhood I came to my dad saying please forgive me mm -hmm. but I was like I forgive you like you don't even like it was a very strange thing that I felt right. attracted to so when I could just lay it all out to to, to the living God mm -hmm. and have the priest pr pronounce in the in the words of Jesus speaking through him you know I absolve you of your sins the weight that's thrown off you in confession is yeah. like you you, you didn't even realize that what you did 10 years back, even as a, as a five-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. I, I confess that in my first confession and to, right. to, to feel that definitively yeah. removed, blotted out from the record of existence. I was just like, wow. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, it really is. Yeah. So, uh, so we have about 12 minutes left. You're in the, you're in the church. Again, we've heard a lot of this background. I'm, I'm sure lots has happened since then. Talk about what happened after you became Catholic yeah. and then some of what has transpired since. God bless. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't been to Latin Mass in a long time, but right after I became Catholic, my, my godfather, David Delighton, was like, I'm sending you to, to, to this summer camp. Mm -hmm. It was with the FSSP, who are a, a, the fraternity of, um, of St. Peter. They're, they're fully in communion with, with Rome, and mm -hmm. they do the, the traditional Latin Mass. Right. But they had this summer camp, and it was there that uh, I was given all this, like, you know, you know, what is the rosary? What is uh, mm. just all the, the popular piety of Catholicism sure, sure. I didn't grow we up can't. with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I weirded out all the other campers because they, they would always dread when it was my turn term on the bus to lead a decade of the rosary because I was, you know, uh, on fire with conversion. So I would be, Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> the Lord is with thee. And I'd be like saying it so, and they'd be like, yeah. Oh, oh, you got to say it. And, they, and then they're trying to help me with their swords with the blessed heart of the blessed heart of the blessed heart of Jesus, holy Mary, mother, God, prayer, and God, damn, right? Whereas I was just like effusive and everything, yeah. which yeah. looking back, I would have been mad at myself at 15. Like, you really just need to hurry up. You're taking this a little too uh, yeah. seriously. Yeah. But it was huh. a beautiful time mm -hmm. to like be just, all things were new. Yeah. And I was learning all this, uh, you know, beautiful tradition and history and all mm -hmm. these little Catholic devotions and practices. And, uh, you know, it was it was a beautiful summer camp. And then after that, I was thrown into the fire because all my friends are still evangelical for the next like 10 years. Mm. And they were like, you're an idiot. And so then it, 10 years of theological debate and uh, I was in speech and debate in high school and it was just, and that really made my brother and I um, just really on fire with the apologetics. We loved getting into the, mm -hmm. when you're in high school, every question is life and death. You right. care, you care right. about things you're so deeply. And we, we got into a lot of lovely discussions um, and I had a, a couple of friends uh, convert. Shockingly, one of my friends, he and I got into it. So I was like, our, our biggest debate at, over a five-year period of just lots of debates and debates and debates, a five-year period, it, it came uh, to a head with baptism. And I was like, you know, you're, you're off base even from the Protestant reformers with baptism. Mm. Most of them believe that baptism was necessary for salvation. Luther burned people at the stake, authorized the burning people at the stake because 
and I'm, and I'm loosely quoting, he said, it's a far greater violence to leave a, an, in, an innocent soul unbaptized than it would be to burn these mothers and fathers at the stake. Oh, man. So like most Protestants don't get that the, the sort of postmodern Protestantism, non-denominationalism in its rejection of baptism doesn't go back to the Reformation. It, it's yeah. a new thing, which is fine. Yeah, a very new thing. It's, yeah. a, it's a fine thing. But um, my, uh, my friend and I got into that, and finally we got into this yelling match. It was the first time it got unpleasant. I, and I'll never forget, he went off to his Protestant Bible college, called me three months later, hadn't talked to him in three months, said, Paul, I'm going to become Catholic. And I was like, <laughs> what? Are you pulling my leg? Like He's like, I'd like you to be my, my sponsor. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Till he received the sacraments, I thought... The whole time it might be a ruse, and he was you know, like, "No, but he's now one of the holiest men, uh, fully oh, Catholic. He's in a beautiful Catholic marriage, um, and I now have ten gut children." Oh man, praise yeah, God! Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm I'm very blessed to have been entrusted with uh, having to pray for yeah. ten ten souls, um, and I then moved to Boston because I was kind of dying on the vine in California. There's not there's not a lot of young adult community in California in mm. general. In mm. the California, I was in Silicon Valley where. The average home worth is worth like two million dollars, mm. so there are no young people right. in their early twenties. There's not a lot of universities. Everyone is a, is like either ten years old or forty years old, which is fine. That's just the the, the demographic is right. not like a college town. Boston is all young people in their twenties because mm. there's seventy eight universities and eight hundred thousand college students. It's insane. Right. Mm-hmm. So I moved to Boston, and immediately I was like, oh my gosh, no longer are my friends just going to battle me about my faith, but now they're going to like challenge me and show me things I didn't even know about my Catholic faith. Boston is a great place to be young and Catholic. Hmm. Every church is booming to the gills with young people who are uh, serious about their faith. The RCA class at my local parish is 50 strong, 50, 60 wow. a year, all young people my age. It's like, wow. it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. My wife has since been received into the church and baptized. She wasn't baptized uh, in her in her evangelical tradition. But, Did you guys uh, meet in, in Boston? Or? We actually met in California, okay. but then we reconnected out in Boston because she was going to gotcha. Wellesley College. She okay. was going to a, like a very, even a very liberal kind of, um, like you know, the furthest thing from a Catholic school. But mm-hmm. um, she uh, was received into the church a few years ago, and um, I mean, just such amazing liturgy, such amazing people, mm-hmm. amazing formation. I'm going to be very sad. My my wife and I may leave Boston in the next year or so because mm-hmm. we've been there for five years, mm-hmm. and it's. It's then it, the opposite problem happens. Like my, my wife and I are building a family, and in Boston, once you get to the building a family stage, then it's like now you're out of place again because it's like a place for young people who right, are right. who are meeting other people and and uh, you know preparing for that next stage in their life. But it, it's probably time to, to to move on soon, which we're very sad about because uh, two of my best friends are priests. Mm. Like I've been on uh, three international trips with, with priest friends this year. Yeah. Like we are just so blessed to be so close. And they're young priests. Boston is one of the only dioceses in the country with no shortage of priests. They mm. have a surplus. There's parochial vicars just sort of doing nothing. Just like, <laughs> ha- no, not doing nothing, but like being, <laughs> being shepherds to young adults right, by right. being friends with them and leading yeah. liturgy. And it's just a really remarkable place to, to deepen your faith. And that's where I discovered, um, my my project sing the hours that's yeah. where we have, again we have six minutes left i really want to get talked about that talk us about the but the liturgy of the hours and then your project sing the hours yeah when people say oh catholics don't use the bible or read the bible we don't re- read or use it we pray it yeah it flows out of Constant. our liturgy yeah. it flows in the liturgy of the hours the catholic church is busy at offering god's own words back to him and when and when christ teaches us to pray our father blah 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 we're, we're giving Christ's words back to him. That's why that prayer is so special to Christians. Right. I feel bad for even saying our father, blah, blah, blah. It's not blah, blah, blah. It's the most, it's the most important prayer we've ever been given. Yeah. And that's the important thing about what separates that Byzantine church and that Catholic church that maybe was doing some modern music and that Latin mass church and whatever. What separates that type of religious framework from evangelical is that they are, as a corporate body, taking very seriously giving God's own words back to him. Yes. And it matters so beautifully that in doing that, it can change the world. In giving God's own words back to him, when he says, I bat- go to all nations, those are Christ's words when he says, mm-hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we obey that, we believe that Christ himself recreates that soul. Right. So giving God's own words back to him, instead of making up you know, our mm-hmm. own prayers and everything, that has its perks. Right. Because then amazing things happen when, when we use the same words that created the sea and sky, because mm-hmm. God spoke the universe into existence. That can recreate the universe. It can it can help us sanctify the world as lay people. That's our mission as lay people is to make holy the secular. Yeah. And um, 
So Catholic prayer, universal prayer, is just taking God's words and giving them back to him. So priests give God's words back to him through the words of Christ's ancestor David in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. The Liturgy of the Hours, this book is simply a four-week organization of the book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you go through the cycle and then it has all these other ancient prayers, hymns, antiphons. It's a whole thing. Yeah. But I discovered this again. We have Uncle Frank. God bless Uncle Frank. Yeah. He, when, uh, when I was a, a late teenager, he was like, Paul, when he was in town, let's pray the Liturgy of the Hours. I was like, I don't know what that is, but let's do it. And he, would, he and I would sing it. And we would always sing it because Uncle Frank was a believer that prayer is sung. That's why he loves the Eastern rites and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we would sing the Liturgy of the Hours together. And then when I was, uh, you know, years back in COVID, mm -hmm. I was in, a, in a, a sad spot of time. All of us were. It was a, it was a terrible, yeah. terrible time. Yeah. But um, I remember that practice my Uncle Frank had of, of singing the Psalms. And I thought, you know, singing helps your mm -hmm. mood. Like James says, he says, is any of you joyful? Let him sing. That's uh -huh. from, from the book of James. And it's true. And singing makes one joyful as well. Yeah. We, we all know that as humans. Um, and so I thought, you know, I was, I was counseled. Why don't you sing, but sing the Psalms, just like you know how to do. I was familiar with the Liturgy of the Hours, but only as like something I dabbled in. Mm -hmm. So I started doing all of them. And man, that was my conversion. Mm -hmm. I was received into the Catholic Church when I was 14, mm -hmm. but I was, um, the, the Eucharist was unlocked in me in a special way. You cannot live without the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Christ says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. But then Christ, talking about living, says, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from mm -hmm. the mouth of God. So we receive bread from heaven mm -hmm. in Christ, but simply eating does not mean you're a healthy, thriving individual. Mm -hmm. There are other things that help too. Like, um, I, I, I like to think of the analogy as, because this is a scriptural analogy, like the Eucharist is the seed by which you can't grow a plant without a seed. Mars, you know, is a barren wasteland. There's no, there's no seeds there. Mm -hmm. The Eucharist is the seed, but the scriptures, which is why mm -hmm. Catholics pray the scriptures constantly as a corporate yeah. body, are the water that turns that seed into a mountain that fills the whole earth. Yeah. You know, the scriptures are, you, you cannot live without the word of God that flows forth from the revelation in the scriptures. And so I started doing Liturgy of the Hours and I was looking for resources to sing it and I couldn't really find any. So I thought I'm going to sing it. You made it. And so <laughs> Sing the Hours exists and it is a, it is morning prayer and evening prayer, which lay people are invited to do by the Second Vatican Council. And before that, like the reason why a nun prays the Psalms all the time, even though she's not ordained as a priest, mm -hmm. she's a lay person, mm -hmm. a nun, but she enters into the highest vocation singing the psalms all day. That's what, if right. you've ever wondered, what does a nun or monk do? That is traditionally what the calling of them, it's to sing the praises of God eternally, but on earth with, with, with your brothers and sisters. So I couldn't recommend enough yeah. the praying of the psalms if, if you want to continue, as is so important, to convert daily, to die daily like St. Paul, to die daily and grow the garden that is planted with the Eucharist. Praying the psalms is just A1. It's why priests have to do it for, for their spiritual life, and it's why lay people are invited to. And so that's where, and now my wife and I, oh my gosh, she used to say, I can't sing. I'll never sing. Uh -huh. We chant the Psalms together every day. Mm -hmm. And it is such a beautiful thing for when she's chanting the, the two lines, because mm -hmm. you, you always alternate by two lines. When right. she's doing it, mm -hmm. she's prophesying to me, but mm -hmm. with Christ's words, mm -hmm. with the words of the Psalms, just like Christ on the cross prayed the Psalms. And then she pauses and now she's receiving and I'm prophesying to oh, her. Yeah. And we are baptized pre <laughs> priest, prophet, and king. Yeah. And the dignity of lay people praying the Psalms to each other, mm -hmm. it really is our Father. And I know that the Holy Spirit is literally echoing between us. And Christ is there being present, made present in our voices as we chant to each other. And it's absolutely mind-boggling what, yeah. what, what that means for our marriage mm -hmm. and means for our relationship with Christ and putting Him at the center of it. Because we are, as our framework, as our daily sacrifice to each other, we are we are we are whispering Christ's love letters to each other in the psalm. Not not whispering them, singing them, Yeah, which is amazing. Anyway, I, I could go well, on about this for hours, but... I, I appreciate it. Well, I think the best thing to do, because again, there's there's so much good there. Definitely, people check out singthehours.org, because I would say, again, this this universal prayer of the church, the liturgy of the hours, priests are obligated to pray. All of us are encouraged to pray. Uh, and I think one of the best ways for people to get into it, to break into it, if it's something new, is actually to check out singthehours.org. Yeah. It's a really wonderful project. So we pray in for you. Thanks for sharing your story and that project with us. And it's on YouTube and Spotify and everything, too. Yeah. Awesome. So you, you can find it anywhere. Sing the Hours. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. I pray that Paul's story was inspiration to you. We'll be back next week with another story. God bless you and see you then.